Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we have um, John with us, and Professor Jonathan Patterjoy is in the Department of um, Atmospheric and Oceanic Science at University of Maryland. His research focuses on the development and application of advanced data assimilation techniques for studying geograph um, geophysical problems. Much of this work targets um, hazardous weather events then present major challenges for environmental prediction, such as tropical cyclones and severe convective storms. Prior to joining the University of Maryland, um, John hold postdoc fellowships at NOAA, Atlantic Oceanic, and uh, Meteorological Laboratory in Miami, and the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. He also worked briefly as a postdoc at the NOAA National Severe Storm Laboratory in Nome. Zhang holds a PhD in meteorology from Penn State and a bachelor's degree in meteorology and applied mathematics from Millersville University. Let's welcome Zhang. <coughs> All right, thank you. So this talk is uh, it's kind of like an introduction of myself to you guys since I, I just started here uh, a few months ago. And, um, and I'm just going to be sharing some of uh, my progress on this uh, particular problem of uh, applying uh, particle filters for numerical weather prediction. And uh, right now, I'm uh, not only my uh, uh, professor at the University of Maryland, but I'm also an affiliate at NOAA AOML. Uh, and I, I work a lot with the Hurricane Research Division of NOAA. And, uh, and so just as, a, as an introduction, I had to change my, my original introductory slides, uh, but, but this, this, this will be uh, sufficient for what I want to talk about. So, so, so the application of uh, data simulation I'm interested in is numerical weather prediction. And, uh, and, and this problem is particularly hard for a lot of reasons. One, the, the dimensionality of the system is really big. Uh, two, we have a lot of uh, observations that we're going to simulate that relate non -linearly, either nonlinearly to our model state, or they only observe very, various pieces of information for our geophysical system that we're interested in. And, and so here for this particular example, I have the evolution of the uh, mean sea level pressure field uh, and uh, the location of uh, satellite radiance observations we have over this particular domain is just six hour, uh, 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 six hour frequently over, uh, frequency over an entire month. And, um, and the dynamics, of course, are, are nonlinear, and, uh, and we don't really observe everything that's going on. And, uh, and so for all these reasons, this is a very hard problem. <coughs> And, uh, and so just to, uh, to get you a, give a picture of what, what we're interested in when we apply data simulation for NWP, uh, the ultimate goal is you want to come up with an estimate of the conditional probability of a model state X given some past information and present information we have of our, of our natural system. And, th and that's just observations that are, that are going to be stored in this vector Y uh, from some previous time, uh, going all the way back to some past time zero to a present time T. And, uh, and I just have this one-dimensional cartoon illustrating this. And what we would like to do is use that information to come up with an estimate of the future probability density of that, of that uh, state var uh, variable uh, condition on those past and present uh, observations. And so I have P of X uh, uh, superscript P plus 1 given all these observations. And uh, X are given by, the evolution of X with time is given by some uh, forecast model M. So that can be ARW, could be GFS, whatever, whatever model you're working with. And uh, this, this uh, model is imperfect, so we have some error associated with it. And the measurements that we have for a system are related to this model state vector through this, uh, this uh, measurement operator, H. And so H can be something such as a radio transfer model, like I showed in the previous uh, video. Uh, or H can be just simple linear interpolation to, to uh, the, the location of observations from your model state variables. It's, it's, H is just the way that you compare your, your model with what you're observing. And you have errors associated with H and also the measurements themselves. And so you have some error term on, on this. Uh, this vector as well. And so the approach that we've taken for numerical weather prediction is to apply Monte Carlo. And so we're going to adopt ensembles for this problem. And so what we do is we, we, we draw samples from this distribution. We pass those samples through our forecast model. And the results are samples from this distribution. And so we can use that to estimate various quantities that we're interested in, such as the mean, uh, quantiles, the median, or, or, or mode, or, or whatever we want to know about, about this distribution right here. And, and so this is. This is uh, where we are right now for numerical weather prediction, is, is we're trying to use ensembles to probe this PDF right here. Uh, 
And, uh, and so for data simulation, the goal is we want to draw samples from this distribution that we can pass into our forecast model and come up with estimates for that forecast error distribution. And, uh, and so this is really the underlying goal of this talk, is how do we draw samples from this distribution? And not only that, but, but how do we leverage the, the uh, future resources or existing resources we have now to do this better? And, uh, and so one thing I look at is, is how do we use intermediate size ensembles to, do, to solve this problem? And so right now, I'd say we use small ensembles. So maybe like order 100 uh, uh, is what we use for, for current uh, ensemble data simulation and forecasting systems, such as the GFS model uses 80 members. Um, but there are groups out there such as uh, my colleague, uh, Takimasa, who actually used to have the job I have now, um, who's experimenting with 1,000 to 10,000 member ensembles for, for data simulation. And so if you have the resources that someone like he does at the Recon Center in Kobe using the K computer, how would you use those resources? And so this is, this is a big motivating factor for a lot of my work with, with uh, uh, particle filters, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. <clears throat> and so particle filters are a lot like ensemble common filters in that we're using some sample representation of the PDFs that we're interested in. And, uh, and so for particle filters, we call our ensemble members particles. So just so you know throughout this talk, particles and ensemble members are just the same thing, uh, just so you don't get confused. Uh, unlike ensemble common filters, particle filters will converge to the actual Bayesian solution to that data simulation problem that I mentioned earlier, uh, so long as we have a really, really big uh, ensemble and we have a really good handle on the errors represented in our model and our observations. And so if we can, if we can represent those errors perfectly and we have a, a really, really, really big ensemble, particle filters will, will solve that problem. And, uh, and so for that reason, there's been a lot of work trying to get particle filters to work for really high dimensional problems with some approximation. And, uh, and the framework that, that, that I'm gonna be working with for, doing, for, for introducing the method that I'm gonna show is a sequential importance resampling. And, it, and, and this method provides the basic framework for uh, the bootstrap particle filter, which is a, which is a pretty, pretty simple idea, which I'm going to outline in the next couple slides. And so the bootstrap particle filter solves this, uh, this, uh, this uh, Bayesian uh, uh, probability density estimation uh, uh, process. And so what I'm doing is I have uh, some prior probability density, which I'm showing here by this P of X T given some past observations. And so for this univari univariate cartoon example, I just have this simple a uh, very general looking PDF. It's bimodal, ju just, so you, just to show you that, th that this uh, method can work on any, any type of uh, PDF. And, um, and I have some, some likelihood that's giving me some information about some observations that I want to assimilate, that I want to better inform this distribution so I can come up with some posterior uh, estimate, which is going to reflect that new information I'm introducing from that observation. And so from Bayes, the product of this uh, prior density times this likelihood within some proportionality gives us this posterior density. And, uh, and so the first step in this process for particles, particle filters, is we have to draw samples from this prior density. And, uh, and, and so you can think of that as, for example, for, for uh, sequential data simulation that we use for, for uh, numerical weather prediction, this could be just a simple uh, ensemble forecast for this current time uh, that's, uh, that's conditioned on some past observations that we have. And then so the second, the second uh, part of this is we're going to choose a likelihood uh, that's going to reflect the observation errors that we have. And so, for example, in this case, if we know that our observation errors have uh, a log normal form, then we can use a log normal uh, likelihood, which I'm just showing right here. And so, and so this gray area shows the actual, the actual likelihood we're going to use for this, this calculation. And uh, the second step is for the prior, we're going to represent this prior density as just a equally weighted sum of delta functions, one on each of these particles. And so I just have a weight of one over n for each of these, uh, these uh, samples right here. And this gray area right here is just representing the prior density that we're gonna be working with. And from Bayes, uh, we're, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take the product of these two. And that's gonna say that within some proportionality that this posterior density is going to be a weighted sum of these particles. And so the weights are shown here are shown here by these gray lines, and you have one in each of these particles. And you can see for this this one particle out here, the the likelihood is zero, and so that one gets uh, gets a zero weight. But the ones that have a higher likelihood are going to be weighted more. And so what you see here is a, a representation of this posterior density that's actually quite general. If you have a really 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 big sample, you can actually solve this problem completely with this particle filter. <clears throat> 
and, and these weights that you're using are just simply going to be proportional to the likelihood of the observations you have for each particle. <clears throat> and then the last step is the particles are just going to be drawn from this delta function representation of this posterior PDF uh, by sampling with replacement based on the prior samples you have, or the prior particles, and these weights. And so particles that have higher weights are going to be sampled multiple times, as I'm showing here for this example. And again, this particle out here that has a zero weight is going to be completely removed. And so, and so that's the last step in this, uh, this bootstrap uh, particle filter. And so, like I said before, there's been a lot of work going into trying to get these uh, general particle filter ideas to work for pretty high dimensional problems. And uh, most of this work is focused on uh, localization. And, and so, so covariance localization is how ensemble common filters work for high dimensional problems. What we do is we represent PDFs using a Gaussian. And we remove cross covariances of far distances in our model space using covariance localization. And so that's how ensemble common filters work. Without localization, we couldn't use them for numerical weather prediction. And so a lot of work has gone into trying to get particle filters to work for this type of problem. And, uh, and so th there's many different approaches out there. The one I'm going to be talking about today is, is one that, that I actually came up with back in 2016. And I have, uh, I have an updated version of this filter that just came out in MWR recently. And it's just simply called the local particle filter. And I'm not saying this method is better than any of these. It's just, uh, it's just, it's just my own, so I understand it more. And also, it's designed in a way that allows it to work, uh, work well with pre-existing software that we have. And so, and so by design, it's easy to, to test out some, some of these ideas with, uh, with real NWP models. And, uh, and so, like I said, what you can do is you can take this, this uh, localized particle filter, and you can leverage pre-existing infrastructure that we have uh, for data simulation research and operations in the US, uh, namely the data simulation research test bed, which is maintained by NCARB, and the, uh, the ensemble uh, component of GSI, which we use for operational models. And, uh, and this localized particle filter algorithm will fit well into these two filters. And I've actually done that over the last couple of years, was, was take this, taking this localized particle filter and put it right into DART and GSI. And so the, way, the easiest way to understand how this method works is to, is to look at what it does in the context of what square root filters do in DART and GSI. And, uh, and so in order to demonstrate this, I put together this, this very simple two-dimensional problem. And, uh, and so what I have here is this prior distribution, which is shown by this uh, two-dimensional joint PDF of X1 and X2, which is shown by the shading right here. Again, it's just a, it's a bimodal distribution, just to keep things a little bit general. And, uh, and, I, and I took some samples from this distribution, which are shown by these blue uh, markers right here. And I introduced one observation. It's a direct observation of one of the variables, x1. And I'm going to assimilate that observation using the same type of filter that we use for DART and uh, the GSI ENKF. And, uh, and so the way this is done is through what they call the parallel algorithm, in which we, we perform the simultaneous update of the observation space and the state space. And, uh, and, and what I'm going to do is just talk you through how that's done. And, uh, and so first way to look at this is seeing what's happening in observation space. And so for observation space, we're focusing on just uh, x1. So what's happening to x1 right here when you do data simulation? And uh, here I'm just showing the, uh, the marginal PDF of, of, of that variable and the samples associated with it we're just showing right here. And, uh, and then you can go back to Bayes, and, and, and you can make some approximations, that we, like, such as what we do for ensemble common filters. And uh, the approximations are that this distribution is Gaussian, which means that in order to estimate this PDF, all you have to do is, uh, is estimate a sample, sample mean and sample error variance. And, and that's how you can just calculate what this is. And, uh, and we know from, uh, from, from, from uh, uh, a variety of papers uh, that we can transform this sample into, into samples from this posterior distribution using various ensemble common filter techniques, and so various square root filters that exist. And, um, and so there's a number of different ways of doing that. I'm not, I'm not going to go over that today, but, but this is essentially what these methods do. They just, they just transform samples from, from this PDF into this, this Gaussian representation of the posterior PDF. And, uh, and then that's for the, 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 observa the, the variable that's observed. And so that's observation space. For state space, what this, uh, this, this uh, square root filter is going to do is it's essentially going to update the unobserved quantities just by using uh, multivariate linear regression. And, uh, and so what I did here was I just, I just showing you what's happening to the, uh, the mean of each of these, uh, the mean of these uh, samples and the perturbations from the mean. 
And, uh, and the representation looks like this. You have just the, the prior mean plus uh, some, some, uh, uh, <coughs> some, some matrix K, which is your common gain matrix. And, and you could think of it as just a matrix of uh, regression coefficients. And it's going to, uh, to update the mean based on, on these regression coefficients and the difference between your observation and your prior. And, uh, and, then, and then for your, your perturbations about, about the mean, it looks something similar to that, except K has some slight modification to it. And so what that means is when, when you perform this multivariate update, these uh, samples can only move along that line. And that, and that line is given by the, uh, uh, essentially by, by the, the covariant, the, the, cross, uh, the, the error covariance between X1 and X2. Now for, for uh, particle filters, or the local particle filter, I'm going to adopt a very similar strategy in which we have this joint observation uh, state space update that we're going to track through all the observations. And so, so one thing I should mention here is, is uh, both these, uh, these uh, uh, square root filters that are implemented in GSI and DART assume that you can take your observations and batch them and assimilate batches uh, sequentially. And the local particle filter does the same exact thing. And so that's a, that's a valid assumption so long as the, the uh, uh, error covariance between, or the error correlations between your observations uh, uh, observation, observation of batches is zero. And so as long as you have uncorrelated errors, you can do stuff like that. And, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the same process for this localized particle filter. For the observation space part, instead of doing that ENKF update, which I showed, you're going to have just a straight particle filter update. And so I have some, some prior uh, representation of this, this PDF, which is given by a sum of delta functions. I'm going to do this multiplication to come up with my weights. And then, and then this, uh, the resampled particles from here are going to be my, my observation space update. <clears throat> now for state space, it's going to look a bit different. I'm going to take the original ENKF update equations, which I showed, and I'm going to replace them with this, these sets of equations right here. The first one updates the mean. The second one updates the perturbations about the mean. And, uh, and so this, this update equation for the mean is just going to be a, a weighted sum of your prior particles that you have. And, uh, and these weights are, are vectors of the same size as Xn. This is a sure product right here. And, uh, and, and for this part right here, the perturbations about, about this mean update are going to be given by this uh, weighted sum of prior perturbations and, and perturbations from your sampled particles. And these coefficients R1 and R2 are functions of omega n. So when omega n changes, so does R1 and R2. And, um, and so, all, so this, this step right here is going to be entirely dependent on, on what omega n is. And I'm going to go into more detail of what, that, what, that vector, what those vectors look like in the next couple of slides. And, uh, and so what this step does is it comes up with a state space update that is supposed to reflect, reflect a mix of the particle filter and prior solutions. And so what that means is you can apply things such as, such as localization or inflation like you do for ensemble common filters. And so it's going to be, it's going to perform some, some uh, um, step that looks a lot like, like what, what ensemble common filters do, but while preserving some, some nonlinear updates when, when, when you do this, instead of relying completely on, on uh, 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 linear regression. All right. And so this step is necessary because if you just naively applied the, uh, the bootstrap filter for this two-dimensional problem, you can, you can see that it actually collapses pretty quickly. And so here what I did was, I had this example where, where I went and I simulated a second observation, and, and this is a uh, direct observation of X2 after assimilating uh, uh, this Y1 right here. And this, this bootstrap particle filter collapses on the four, four unique particles after this step, whereas the localized particle filter gives you a, uh, a set of unique particles that are essentially sampling from the second mode right here. And, uh, and so what this, what this method does is it, it gives you a way of pre preventing your filter from collapsing onto just a subset of particles. And so this, this collapse of the, uh, of the standard uh, bootstrap particle filter um, is, is something that's been studied quite a bit and has some, there's, a, there's a number of nice papers out there that actually go through some conditions for why it collapses. And uh, so there's three papers from 20, 2008, which are all co-authored by uh, Chris Snyder, uh, Bickle, and, and, and Bengston, and they outline some conditions for, for, for uh, the collapse of this method with Gaussian errors. And, uh, and so what they showed was to prevent a, a maximum weight of one, meaning that prevent your particle filter from collapsing just to one unique particle, what you need is an ensemble size that's going to increase exponentially with the variance of, of the sum of these terms right here, these Vs. And each of these Vs is just a negative log likelihood of your observations for your particles. And so what that says is that if P of Y given Xn for a variety of particles is really small, 
then the log of that's going to be a really big number and your variance is going to be really big. And so that means you're going to need an exponentially, you know, like bigger ensemble size to solve that problem. And, uh, and also if you have many observations, its variance is also going to be quite a big. Because you have the summation over observations and y right here. And, uh, and so if you have many accurate measurements that you want to assimilate, such as, such as many satellite observations or, or radar observations or something like that, your particle filter is going to collapse unless you provide some, some additional, um, <coughs> some, some additional uh, constraints on the update, such as this localization inflation ideas I'm going to mention. All right, and so the first step in actually preventing that collapse is to apply localization. And so this goes back to these omegas, which I, sh which I showed uh, earlier on for, for performing that, that update. And so the omegas are the same size as your, your state vector, and they're designed to modulate the influence of observations using localization. And so localization is just going to be, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come into these weight calculations as these rows, and each of these rows is some value between 0 and 1 that's just going to reduce the, the marginal update of a state variable in your system based on this factor rho depending on how far away it is from observation. And so for this equation right here, if rho is 1 everywhere, then these 1s cancel, and, and this equation gives you back the standard bootstrap particle filter. And so if you have a really, really big sample size, and you don't have, and maybe, maybe you have uh, many observations, but not a lot, and they're not super accurate, you can use a, a larger, uh, uh, a broader localization, and, and you can get back the, part, the bootstrap particle filter with no approximation. But if you have a system where, you re where that requires a lot of localization, you can specify rho to be, to be close to zero or between zero and one for a lot of your state variables and prevent collapse locally at those locations. And, uh, and, so, <clears throat> and so this is the first, uh, the first factor that goes into, uh, uh, into trying to prevent weight collapse for this localized particle filter. And so going back to uh, what I said about the, uh, the Bengtson, Bickel, and Snyder papers, um, what you can do is you can, you can take these omegas and rewrite them to just be, uh, to be the uh, exponent of the sum of these v's, where you have, a, where you have, a, you have a unique v for every your state variables. And, uh, and, and what it turns out that these v's are just going to be the negative log of everything that's in these uh, brackets right here. And so what that means is that for, for a given grid point, when rho is less than 1, that's directly going to reduce the variance of those v's, and that's going to prevent the collapse from occurring. And so at least at, at least for, for some problems, this localization is going to directly prevent that collapse. But you can see where it's not going to work, though. And so if you have a bunch of observations that are co-located with each other, for example, then localization is not going to help you because, because the, the, these rows are usually designed so they're, they're equal to one close observation, so you're not localizing. And so if you have a bunch of observations that are right next to each other, this method is not going to work, and it's just going to collapse. And so that, that brings us to the last part, which is inflation. And, uh, and so the way I'm going to implement inflation in this particle filter framework looks a lot, like, looks a lot different than, than what we do for ensemble common filters. And so what I'm going to do is uh, for, first just acknowledge that if rho is, rho is often in, in, insufficient for preventing weight collapse uh, for reasons like I mentioned before. If you have a bunch of co-located observations, it's not going to work. Also, if you have very accurate observations, it's also not going to work all the time. Um, so you need something else. And so, so the, probably the easiest way of, of just solving this problem, or at least a first guess of what you can do to prevent weight collapse for, for these, uh, these, uh, localized co these this, this uh, localized collapse, is to introduce uh, a term beta in, in front of the Vs. And so what that's going to do is it's just going to directly uh, put a cap on, on the variance in those Vs, and it's not going to prevent, and it's going to prevent the weight collapse. And so by putting a beta in here, it's the same as introducing a beta in the exponent of, of these weights right here. And, um, and so one, one nice property about this is, is what you can do is you can choose beta to adaptively satisfy some, some heuristic measure of collapse. And, uh, and so, for example, uh, one, one thing that, that we look at a lot when, when we're judging whether a sample is, is, um, is <coughs> um, has a diverse set of solutions or not is the effective ensemble size. And so the effective ensemble size is a way of, of, uh, of comparing a uh, unweighted sample with a weighted sample. And, and, so, and so what is the, what is the, you know, the ensemble size that that, that weighted sample has uh, or is, is representing compared to the unweighted sample here? And, uh, and so what you can do is you can, you can uh, choose a beta so that it satisfies some threshold value for the effective ensemble size. And so that, that, that gives you some control over how much you're going to let your weights collapse locally. 
And, uh, and so this is uh, going to act a lot like installation for, for Ensemble Commons filters, but implemented in a very different way. All right. Now, those are some, some pretty uh, uh, esoteric ideas. And, uh, and so in order to actually show you what they do, I put together a, a pretty simple geophysical problem so we could examine the sensitivity of those two mechanisms uh, for the particle filter update. And, uh, and so for this application, what I did was I took a, uh, an axisymmetric uh, ranking vortex, uh, which has a profile that looks like this, and I interpolated it onto a two-dimensional grid. And, uh, and so all I have is I started with a, a tangential wind profile that looks like this, that, that, that uh, it, it starts at some, some constant value far away from the center of the vortex and increases to a value up here, which is at the, the radius of max winds before, before decreasing linearly. And then, and then you just fold this over and you get, and you get this uh, axisymmetric wind profile. And then interpolating this to a two-dimensional grid gives you a result that looks like that. And so what I'm showing here is wind speeds greater than 15 meters per second are in this hatched region and values less than are, are in this, the white region. And, um, and then taking these uh, tangential winds, I, I put them into U and V coordinates. Uh, and so my model state vector looks like this. And so X is just going to be U and V at all the locations on a grid in this two-dimensional domain. And so this is, this is mimicking what, what a, um, how say a weather model would represent a vortex, just using U and V winds for, for the state variables. And, uh, and then from here, I, I uh, generated a set of prior, uh, prior samples by taking the axisymmetric wind profile and just shifting 100 vortices. And so they have identical structure, but different positions. And so these colored lines right here are each of those prior vortices. The black one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call my truth, and I'm, gonna use, and I'm gonna use that to generate some observations. And, uh, and so just to reiterate, I have a sample of vortices right here that are exactly the same, except they just have a different, they just have some position error. And uh, what I'm trying to mimic here is what happens for, say, tropical cyclones uh, in weather models, when we have some sample representation of the prior for a tropical cyclone, but each of the tropical cyclones in your model has, has a different location. And it's a really, it's a really complex problem, actually. Um, and uh, it causes a lot of difficulties for our, uh, our, current, end, our current data simulation systems for NWP. And uh, on the right, right here, I'm just showing you some observations I created from the truth with some added errors. And, uh, and, and so these, uh, these colored uh, uh, red values right here are, are positive uh, tension or radio winds, and negative uh, radio winds are shown right here when green. And, uh, and so I'm mimicking what happens when you fly a plane into a tropical cyclone. Or say you have a radar and you're measuring like one quadrant of a mesovortice or something like that. This is an application that actually, that actually is seen a lot in, in weather prediction. And I'm going to assimilate these observations uh, based on that prior to give you a picture of how this localized particle filter is going to form updates. In particular, what I'm interested in is examining the sensitivity of, the, of this uh, update to rho and beta. And, and so rho, like I mentioned before, are my localization coefficients. And the way I'm specifying them is by just taking an exponentially decaying function, uh, g, which is going to look a lot like a Gaussian. And, uh, and so what that means is for a given observation, uh, the localization is going to decrease to zero exponentially away from, from the observation locations. And so going back to here, you just choose an observation right there. And so the row at this point is going to be one. And it's going to exponentially decrease to zero far away from it. And, um, and so this is, again, this is just mimicking what we do for ensemble common filters uh, right now. And, uh, and, and, and the, 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 uh, the shape of that function, or, or the, the uh, the rate at which it decreases away is just going to be specified by this uh, length scale parameter r. And for beta, I'm going to solve numerically for the beta that prevents weights from exceeding some threshold value of effective ensemble size. And so I'm going to, I'm going to essentially show you the sensitivity of this particle filter to r and, and the threshold NEF that are specified for, for localization and inflation. <clears throat> and so for the first part, what I did was I, I specified a uh, length scale of, of R, I mean, of R that's, that's, that's infinite. And so that's essentially applying no localization at all. And the left, I'm showing you uh, the particle weights for, for each of the variables in our system. And, uh, and on the right, I'm showing you the posterior particles. And so this is essentially the same as just applying the, the regular uh, uh, bootstrap particle filter for this problem. And with 100 particles, it's, it's definitely going to collapse just to one, which is pretty close to the truth. And it actually takes upwards of, uh, of 10,000 or more particles uh, for this problem to prevent it from collapsing. 
And so even for this very simple uh, axisymmetric vortex problem, this, this, this particle filter is going to require very, very, very large samples to prevent it from collapsing. And then, uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce some localization by just setting a length scale parameter that's five times the domain width shown here. And, and immediately, once you introduce this localization, you start to see some diversity in your samples. And they look pretty, pretty close to axisymmetric um, with, with some deviations, of course, because you have this localization. And what's happening is, is uh, in this part of your domain, you see more posterior uh, variance because, because the localization is going to, uh, is going to force you to, to, uh, to do that, essentially. What you're going to do is you're going to uh, um, uh, enforce this localization for observations that are over here. They're going to approach a prior far away. And so on this side of the domain, you start to see some of the effects of localization faster. And uh, then you go to the next one. Uh, this is four times the domain width, and then three times. And, and then you can start to see it really break down and, and, and form some pretty big asymmetries in the vortices. This is two times the domain width. And all the way down to just the domain width itself, you see what's happening is the, the particle filter solution is starting to look, is starting to, to collapse closer to the truth here, but, pro but provide no update over here. And so the localization, of course, uh, when, when, you, when you specify it in your, in your weather prediction uh, application, you have to consider the, the, the dynamics of your problem itself. And so you can't just specify a very, very short localization. Otherwise, it's going to give you um, features that look like this, which are suboptimal. <clears throat> All right, so for beta, I'm going to start off with an effective ensemble size of 1. And what that means is beta is, is, not, is just going to be 1 everywhere. And so the, the, the minimum value for your effective ensemble size is going to be 1, which means that all your weights collapse. And so this is just this, what, what your, your solution looks like if you only apply localization, essentially. No, no, um, no inflation through beta. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, a little bit of uh, uh, extra posterior spread by increasing uh, this effective ensemble size. And so here, just, just going from uh, NEFF to, to one, from 1 to 2, you see a pretty big, big difference in, in the posterior spread in your samples and, and also in, in the way the weights are going to be represented. And you can go from uh, all the way up to, say, about 4. And, and you can see that this, this method is going to just gradually increase the spread in your ensemble. And so it gives you some extra handle on, on, um, <clears throat> on how, much your, your posterior, how large your posterior spread is going to be, just like various uh, inflation mechanisms that, that we use for ensemble common filters. All right, and so when, when, uh, when all that is, uh, is said and done, uh, this, this, you could say this localization inflation provide a um, a particle filter-like solution while maintaining some of the benefits of uh, over the Gaussian methods. And so if you apply an ensemble common filter for the same problem, <clears throat> this method uh, does pretty well near the observations. But for the unobserved quantities in your system, where it relies entirely on multivariate linear regression, you start to see, see some issues. And so what, 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 what it gives you is a set of very asymmetric storms. And so this is actually something we see a lot when we apply ensemble common filters for, for uh, tropical cyclones and, and uh, mesoscale data simulation applications. Um, you actually see some dual vortices in here. Like, like there's, there's one vortex here, and, and there's probably another one in here that's associated with the same member. And this is stuff, again, we see it a lot. And in fact, this has actually led the operational centers to apply uh, various uh, heuristic uh, modifications uh, during data simulation, such as vortex bogusing. And so what that means is they actually extract the vortex from, from the prior members and they, and they reinsert it uh, at the actual loca observed location of storms. And the reason, one, one big reason why they do that is to, is to make this, the prior look more, more Gaussian and, uh, and to avoid problems like this one. And, uh, and so, like I said, this is a pretty, pretty big problem for NWP. And the localized particle filter members, of course, are not completely axisymmetric, but they're better than the ENKF members for this, this application. <coughs> Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so what I did was uh, I, I specified the localization length scale so the R to be say like I don't know five times this distance right here or four times that distance or so or so and so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah. One domain width actually isn't much localization. Yeah. yeah and so if you, if you go, if we, if you went back to the like the demonstration I showed for localization, the smallest length scale I looked at was one domain width, and that's where it was giving you, giving you pretty much no update on one quadrant of your domain. <clears throat> 
And so, and so what you said is correct. Yeah, that, that is, so, so if you have like one domain width of localization, that, that's actually a really short, short localization parameter. And so for this, I believe I'm, I'm using probably like three or four, uh, both for the ENKF and, and for the particle filter. Uh, ENKF, if you, if you increase the, the localization to infinity, and so essentially apply no localization for the ENKF, it gives you a very similar result, actually. It, it, it still cannot really do much of, uh, to these uh, state variables out here. <coughs> All right. And, uh, and so uh, I should mention before I go, go on further that, that this uh, localized particle filter is currently being uh, applied for, for various research projects at NSSL and OU using this uh, experimental ensemble data simulation forecasting system called the NSSL Experimental Warnock Forecast System for Ensembles, or NUSI. And, uh, and so what NUSI is, is a, I had a video of NUSI before I had to take it out of my presentation because of technical issues. But it's just a, uh, it's a rapidly updating, convective, permitting uh, ensemble DA system. And, uh, and so it starts with the, uh, the, the HER uh, at AT&T, so the high resolution rapid refresh ensemble, which is a one hour cycling uh, uh, experimental operational system. And uh, it grabs the states at at and and then performs 15 minute cycling data simulation using satellite, radar, surface observations, and so on, using the, uh, the, the DART EAKF. And, um, and so they use this for, for doing various uh, experiments during the spring and summer uh, in, the, uh, in the west when, when they have uh, severe out weather outbreaks. And, uh, and so I, I visited NSSL for six months and, and did some work with them on this, on this uh, Newsy setup. And I do have some really good results to share with that, but I'm actually not going to talk about them today because I actually have more interesting results to show in the next, in the next uh, several slides. And, um, but, but this is something that uh, is still in the works. We still have... Uh, there's one, one student at OU who's running many experiments with the localized particle filter using, using a slightly bigger ensemble. So this is only using 36 member ensemble, uh, 36 member ensembles for the, for the DART EAKF and local particle filter. But they're looking at, at uh, expanding that to see what this localized particle filter can do for convective scale applications. Uh, what I'm gonna be uh, talking about for the rest of this talk is uh, some, some recent experiments I performed uh, on, a, on a broader scale using this experimental regional uh, data simulation forecasting setup, which I'm going to talk about in the next couple slides. And so on the top right here, I'm showing the, the evolution of uh, mean sea level pressure and, uh, and conventional observations and satellite observations down here over, over a whole month. So this is the same video I showed on, on the uh, opening slide of this presentation. And, uh, and so this is a, a really tough application because it's, it's, uh, the domain is planted right over the um, <clears throat> right over the tropics, and uh, during a period where we saw several major hurricanes develop, and so actually, if you look closely in here, you'll see you'll see Irma, uh, Jose, and uh, and Maria, and, and a couple other uh, major storms from the 2017 uh, season track into the domain or develop, and um, and, and so it's a uh, you know it's a really it's really really tough data simulation problem and a good test bed for for this this localized particle filter method, uh, namely because. It's a, uh, it's a really, it's a really you know, big, multi-scale, complex problem that really challenges some of these ideas which I put forward, such as localization, inflation, and this particle filter framework. <coughs> and uh, just, just some details on this prediction system. This is an experimental modeling system that I put together for the, uh, the, the NOAA HWARF model uh, over the last year and a half while I was at AOML. It, it just, uh, it's, a very, it's a very simple system. It, require, it, it relies entirely on just sequential data simulation through the GSI ENKF to, pr to provide uh, updates uh, over that whole domain which I showed. Uh, we actually were able to run this system in uh, near real time the last two years using a much bigger domain which I showed there. And, um, and what we do is we actually were able to uh, uh, estimate biases for satellite radiance measurements on the fly because we have a big enough domain. And I'm actually borrowing those bias correction values for these uh, smaller domain setups, which I, which, I mentioned, which I showed in the previous couple of slides, uh, so I can uh, get a good uh, estimate of biases for satellite radiances before I simulate them and uh, provide some, you know, a, a nice framework for, for some interesting research. And uh, I'm just, uh, just, a, just, uh, just reminding you that the conventional clear satellite measurements are being simulated every six hours on a schedule that looks a lot like what the GFS does. And, uh, and so for the test I'm gonna go over, uh, we have a setup that looks like this. We have a pretty coarse grid spacing of, of only 18 kilometers. Uh, observation frequency of six hours, and I'm gonna be looking at two different DA schemes. The, uh, the sequential, uh, sorry, the, the serial ENKF that's in uh, GSI, uh, which is the Whitaker and Hamill filter, 
and the, uh, the localized particle filter of, uh, of these two papers uh, with an ensemble size of 60 members. And uh, for verifying the results, what I did was I, I ran uh, cycling data simulation experiments over the whole month and ignored the first five days to let the system spin up. And I ran five-day forecasts twice a day from a 20-member subsample of that ensemble. And so this gives me an idea of what the forecast skill is for, for this uh, localized particle filter compared to the ENKF. And I'm just going to use a very simple uh, verification metric, uh, volume average root mean square difference between the ensemble mean of my forecast and the GFS analysis. And so what I'm trying to do here is just, uh, is just provide some, some, some measure of how good I'm doing at, at forecasting the mean of that distribution. <clears throat> and um, just go over these re results real quickly. Uh, the root mean squares are averaged over essentially 52 sets of ensemble forecasts for this, uh, this period. And I'm showing here uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, values for U wind, V wind, and pressure. Uh, the uh, particle filter is in blue, and the red is the ENKF. Um, and, uh, and you can see that after about 48 hours or so, I can actually do a bit better than the ensemble common filter with 60 members, which is actually something I did not expect to be able to do. I mean, really, like, like a lot of this work is being motivated by using intermediate size ensembles, so, so 1,000 or more uh, ensemble members. And so I was pretty happy to see this result. Um, and this is uh, going to temperature, specific humidity, pretty much all the variables that I looked at, I, do, I can do a little bit better than the ENKF. Uh, and here, the last two, I have vertical vorticity and uh, mean field pressure. Um, and uh, so that's, that's a quanti quantitative measure of how well this particle filter is doing over this month-long test compared to the ENKF. Some of the more interesting results are actually looking at, at things a little bit more uh, qualitatively. And, uh, and so one thing I did was uh, I noticed a lot, of, uh, a lot of noise in the ENKF solutions after data simulation. And so I, I want to investigate that a little bit more. And, uh, and just looking at the, uh, uh, the vorticity power spectral density for ENKF solutions and particle filter solutions, you see very different results. And so what I'm showing here is I, I took the, uh, uh, for each member, I calculated a power spectra for the uh, vorticity field. And the, the longer wavelengths are shown on the left, the shorter wavelengths are on the right. And, um, and the red values are the average of those, of those vorticity power spectra for, for each member over the whole month-long experiment. And the blue is for the particle filter. And these uh, really fine blue and red lines are 24-hour forecasts that are valid at the same time of each one of those forecasts for the, uh, the ENKF and the localized particle filter. And, uh, and so essentially, these two are right on top of each other, and they should be, because if you run your model out for 24 hours, on average, they're going to give you a very, you know, very similar um, uh, power spectra for the vorticity field. I mean, you're essentially approaching like a climatological value for the model there. Uh, but for the, uh, the, the posterior solutions, you're not necessarily satisfying the dynamics of your system every time you do data simulation. And uh, for the particle filter, you can see it's a little bit, at the, at the smaller wavelengths, you have um, uh, a little bit more noise, a little bit more, more uh, energy, which is something you'd expect. But for the ENKF, that value is much, much bigger. And so you're, at, you're adding a lot extra, a lot more noise in the ENKF solutions compared to the particle filter solutions. And, um, and this goes back to that ranking vortex demonstration, which I showed, where the, where the, uh, the ENKF provided the, the nice update in the vicinity of observations. But on parts of the domain where you're not observing the system, it can't provide a very good update because it relies on this essentially linear regression. And, uh, and so that's really what you're seeing here. And I can actually show you a nice example that, that, that really demonstrates that. And, uh, and so what I did was, uh, first, I just want to note that, that this uh, cutoff, but where, where they're different, is around 150 kilometers. And uh, so if you go to the next slide here, what I did was I just chose one area of the domain that happened to be right around Hurricane Maria for this case. And I looked at the 850 millibar vort vertical vorticity field for wavelengths that are smaller than 150 kilometers. And so what I'm showing here in the top are prior filtered vorticity fields for the ENKF and filtered vorticity fields for the posterior members of the, pro of the uh, particle filter. And I'm uh, sorry, the pri prior members of the particle filter. And the black lines are the GFS analysis for, for the, the vorticity field of the sun. This is kind of a sanity check. And, uh, and so they look very similar for the prior. But as soon as you perform an update, the ENKF has all this extra noise in the posterior members. And this goes back again to the ranking vortex demonstration. What's happening is, is the ENKF is able to fit the op space, uh, is, do a pretty good job in observation space for the update. But for the unobserved, prop, uh, uh, for the unobserved variables in your system, such as all the unobserved 
uh, wind variables in your system, the ENKF is going to produce this noisy update because it, it, it is not it, because because the the, the the underlying dynamics uh, are pretty nonlinear and not constrained well by the six-hour cycling, and that gives you pretty non-Gaussian PDF, and uh, and that's reflected in this update, and uh, and then when you run a six-hour forecast from these members, all that noise goes away. And that's kind of what you'd expect in the model. You see that all the time. You always see adjustments that happen when you when you do data simulation and, and run a short forecast, and, and you see that in the ENKF pretty clear, quite clearly. But for the particle filter, it's uh, you know it's, you don't see as many adjustments. That's because the, the the solutions are more balanced, and and that's kind of what you'd expect once you leave a Gaussian framework and get towards something that's a little bit more general. And uh, and probably the biggest impact this has on on your on your um, Solution is is actually when you use when you use the ensemble for uncertainty quantification, and so if you look at the ensemble spread and vorticity for the particle filter compared to the ENKF, they're very very different, and uh, and so I'm showing here at the initial time is is uh, uh, is the first the particle filter evolution of, of vorticity over this five hour period, uh, sorry of in, in, of uh, variance in the uh, the vorticity, in the ENKF, and at the initial time they're 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 quite close. The particle filter has a little extra spread, but it's it's uh, uh, it's, it's relatively close to the ENKF, but the ENKF has this big drop in, in, uh, in variance in the first six hours because of all the adjustments that are happening when you, when you, uh, when you run that forecast forward in time, whereas the particle filter has this nice quasi-linear revolution of errors with time. And so this is one, one thing that's, uh, that, that really stands out when you look at the solutions for the particle filter compared to the ENKF. All right, just to summarize. Uh, formulating particle filter algorithms that operate well for, for high dimensional problems is a pretty, pretty active area of research. I mentioned a number of studies earlier on in this talk that, that, are, that have introduced uh, some pretty nice algorithms that are trying to tackle the same exact problem. Uh, this research uses an experimental forecasting system uh, that's, uh, that's made for, for, for transitioning research ideas like this into operations. And, um, and I tested this localized particle filter out uh, over a, uh, a month-long uh, case that I chose from, from uh, two years ago and compared the results of the ENKF. And, and actually, I could see some benefits right now with just 60 members. And, uh, and the reason why I think I'm getting these benefits is because I'm, I'm, I'm doing a better job um, creating posterior members that satisfy the mo model dynamics better. And, uh, and so that, that's one thing that, that you should expect, I, I believe, going forward when you apply some of these more general data simulation techniques is you might be able to get away from some of these, these balance issues that you see when we do data simulation for NWP or other geophysical uh, systems. <clears throat> and uh, looking forward, uh, for natural question is, is how well will this method perform with large en ensembles? And so if I, if I were talking about some Yoshi and I had the K computer and I was able to run experiments, like, like what would the results look like? And that's something that, that's some, that I'm really looking forward to going, going uh, forward is, is uh, being able to apply tests like that maybe in the next uh, several years. Um, should, we be, should we begin rethinking Gaussian assumptions for measurement errors? I see this as kind of low-hanging fruit, actually. And so we have a system where if you want to change the parametric form of your observation errors, it's just one line of code. You don't have to change anything else. It's actually very trivial in a particle filter framework to include various forms of measurement errors. And so, and so should we start rethinking things using techniques like that? And, uh, and so this is uh, something I'd like to explore in the future. Uh, also, uh, I have not touched uh, all sky radiance data simulation yet, but I believe this is a really nice framework for doing it because you're at least solving one part of the problem, which is the nonlinearity. Uh, of course, there's a lot of other problems with assimilating all sky radiances. Uh, you have uh, errors in the, you, you have biases in the measurement, you have errors in your, in your forward operator in the, in the model uh, that have to be resolved. But at least if you can if you can isolate the problems a little bit more using, say, a nonlinear method like a particle filter, you may be able to do, do, do more than what we're doing right now. And so that's one, one thing I'd like to, uh, to look at more going forward. Uh, also, how should, we, how should we verify ensembles for, for systems like this that are, that are leaving the Gaussian framework? And so, so say we wanted to look at, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, uh, quantiles, for example, in a, for, in a, in a more general like, like form, a multivariate form, instead of just looking at, at marginals. How do we do that? I, I don't think they're, they're really, I think, I think this is a pretty open question right here. Is how, how should we be verifying our ensembles? Um, and also, uh, what is the best way to formulate localized particle filters? I think this is also a really open area of research as well. What I, what I showed today is by far not the best solution, but it is a solution at least right now, and, uh, and we could probably do a lot better than what I'm doing. Um, at this point, I'll, I'll take any, any questions. 
Good streams. You described earlier how to compute with localization, compute weights that depend on the state variable. So how do you do resampling yeah. in light of that? <laughs> so that's, that's the part I didn't talk about because it's a little more complicated. Uh, so I'm going to go back all the way to the beginning here. <clears throat> All right, so I, ha I have these update equations here. So the mean is really easy to update because these, these weights are giving you information about the marginal probability of, of, of each variable in your system. And, you can, and, and updating the mean is quite trivial. But, but these R1 and R2 coefficients, uh, I actually I derive them to satisfy the first two moments of the posterior given by my weights and my, and my prior particles. And, and so, not, not only satisfy the first two moments, but also satisfy the bootstrap particle filter solution near the observation. And so those are the two, the, the, the two uh, criteria that I want to satisfy with R1 and R2. And so at the location of each observation, you have something that looks, lo looks like the particle filter solution. Far away, you have something that looks like the prior solution. In between, you have something that, that satisfies the first two moments of the posterior, but we don't know what else it satisfies. I mean, it's something that's kind of like a gray area. And so R1 and R2 are derived to, to give you that, that update. So are, are the X, KN primes resampled? Yeah, 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 yeah. So KN is so the those index. Are resampled according to the yeah. non-localized. Yeah, exactly, yes. OK. Yeah. And, and so, in, so you can see the, the deficiency in this method is you have a resampling step for every observation. And, and so I would say that's probably the biggest drawback of this method compared to some of the others out there. <clears throat> Okay, so thanks to the speaker.